Hi, I'm Laura Waters. I'm an HIV doctor from central London, and I shall be talking about COVID and HIV. I have no disclosures that are relevant to this talk. I shall be covering the impact of HIV on COVID, the impact of COVID on HIV, and then I'll finish with some lessons we can learn. Starting with the impact of HIV on COVID. Now, early small case series and small cohorts showed no impact of HIV on COVID mortality, but then larger cohorts, including data from the UK, Western Cape and US, showed that HIV increases COVID mortality by 1.5 to threefold. Now, the key thing is because the studied populations of people with HIV tended to be younger, if you don't adjust for age, which is an important predictor of COVID mortality, you can underestimate or miss altogether the impact of HIV on mortality. These studies also showed that adjusting for comorbidities and other measurable drivers of poor outcomes tends to attenuate the effect, at least partially, with some data that current and the dear CD4 may be important. Reassuringly, the New York State data showed that once hospitalised people with HIV have similar mortality outcomes to those without, and also absolute mortality in the absence of other risk factors is low. A hot debate is do antiretrovirals play a role? The Western Cape data showed lower hospitalised and all case deaths, and Spanish data showed lower rates of COVID-19 diagnosis and hospitalisation in people with HIV treated with a TDF FTC backbone compared to other NRTIs. And that was after adjustment for the important confounder of comorbidities. This is despite the fact that tenofovir probably doesn't have meaningful SARS-CoV-2 activity. Now, one thing I learned during COVID is molecular docking is not the same as in vitro evidence. And in fact, most drugs predicted to be active by molecular docking or computational methods do not have meaningful in vitro or clinical activity. There are currently five active COVID-19 trials using tenofovir. And one is this, which has released some preliminary and promising findings. This open label randomized trial from France took people with PCR confirmed COVID-19 and less than seven days of symptoms and randomized them to seven days of TDF, FTC or standard of care. In a TDF arm, there was faster viral clearance. So whether this translates to fewer transmission or clinical events remains to be seen. A hint that symptom resolution may be faster so one in 10 people did discontinue for mainly GI side effects. In the discussion, the authors discussed why TDF may yield benefit when TAF doesn't, and hypotheses include the pharmacokinetics and the fact that TDF yields higher plasma, therefore higher endothelial exposure to tenofovir, whether it's actually due to the impact of TDF on lipids, which are crucial in viral replication, or its immunomodulatory impact. And the fact we know already in HIV negative volunteers, TDF reduces immune activation. And if this finding is real, this could explain why TDF could achieve benefit in the absence of SARS-CoV-2 activity. Touching briefly now on treating COVID in people with HIV, and just to draw your attention to this guidance that the British HIV Association put out with our National Intensive Care Society, though with lessons that I think are applicable more broadly. Reminding people that HIV testing at admission is important, that the outcomes for critical care in people with well-controlled HIV are good, so they should be prioritised and treated in the same way as their HIV negative counterparts, some specific advice about the impact of some drugs on creatinine and signposting to the Liverpool website for advice about dosing in renal impairment and continuing ARVs when oral intake is not possible. Finally, we offer some conservative advice about the impact of dexamethasone, which is a moderate CYP3A4 inducer on the exposure for some NNRTIs. Moving on to immunity. Now, this is very challenging because we've not been using vaccines for very long. And of course, it's increasingly difficult to study natural immunity as vaccine rollout accelerates. We still don't fully understand which immune correlate is the strongest predictor of protection, nor the magnitude and durability that will be key. 
In terms of natural immunity, there was some data from China showing people with HIV may lose their SARS-CoV-2 antibody responses faster than people without, but the numbers were small with no information on ART, CD4 or viral load. More recent data from the UK showed people with well-controlled HIV and mainly high CD4 counts had similar humoral and cellular immune responses to natural infection as did HIV negative people. Though there was an association between CD4-8 ratio and T cell responses, meaning the T cell response could be impaired in immunosuppressed people, but more data is needed. For vaccines, firstly, to applaud the power of activism. And early on, some infectious disease societies in the US wrote to some of the pharma companies investigating COVID vaccines to argue against the exclusion of people with HIV from vaccine trials. Combined with a strong community voice, this meant in August 2020, Pfizer and Moderna amended their trial protocols to include people with HIV. And most, most studies have included at least some people with HIV since. Because of course, we cannot answer questions if we don't study the populations concerned. In terms of vaccine responses in people with HIV, the most data we have is from the Oxford study, 54 people with well-controlled HIV and high CD4, similar immune responses to HIV negative participants. And for example, there was no correlation between anti-spike IgG and CD4 count. The authors also concluded the vaccine was safe. We're still awaiting the specific data from the Pfizer studies, but some data from Israel in 143 people with well-controlled HIV and high CD4 counts showed very similar and high response rates to two doses of Pfizer vaccine, and the small number of people with low CD4 counts also produced high antibody levels. Other vaccines are summarised in this brilliant article on AIDS map, and you can see the numbers included. The problem being, even in the larger studies such as Johnson & Johnson, the numbers of people with HIV are not enough to draw meaningful conclusions. So we need bigger studies and, importantly, careful collection of real-life data. What about impact on services? How has COVID affected our ability to provide HIV care? And here, things may not be as bad as initially feared. Now, early on, modelling was undertaken, and this model shows, for example, very high numbers of AIDS-related deaths secondary to predicted art interruption in sub-Saharan Africa. But this report out just this month shows it may not be as bad. And in fact, disruptions to treatment were not as severe as feared, meaning less impact in terms of AIDS-related mortality. And where treatment disruptions have been described, they've generally been quickly resolved. What was, was of greater concern in this report was disruptions in prevention, things like opioid substitution, PrEP, STI and HIV testing. And really the prediction is disruption in these services may create a spike in new HIV acquisitions. And of course, in terms of clinical care provision, we've seen rapid unplanned change with little, if any, patient engagement. And for many of us, that's meant shifting from face to face to virtual care, whether that's by telephone, which is what we use in our clinic, email, videos, healthcare apps. But really, this was an existing direction of travel that's been accelerated by COVID. And in fact, there are many examples of success in low and middle income countries preceding the COVID pandemic. Just touching on virtual care and what I think are three key considerations. The first is feasibility. And does the clinic and the service user have access to appropriate hardware, software and private space? Thinking how to overcome language barriers in a virtual setting. We know that not everyone has access to mobile devices or digital data, and it's an area where there is a gender gap. Globally, women are 8% less likely to own a mobile device. South Asia has the widest mobile internet gap, and addressing this gap is considered crucial to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Even in the UK, a high-income country, though admittedly an online survey that may not be fully representative, one in 10 people described not having a confidential setting at home and one in 20 not having enough data or digital devices to access remote care. Secondly, is suitability and the need for physical exam, the need for investigation, how to coordinate multidisciplinary input in a virtual way, particularly, for example, in the context of same day treatment initiation. 
And the fact that face-to-face -face offer, offers opportunities to make every contact count, cervical screening, vaccination, and lifestyle advice, and how to achieve that with virtual care is a challenge. And making sure we're not missing opportunities to detect mental health issues, to detect domestic abuse and intimate partner violence that disproportionately affect people living with HIV, and being mindful that if we're offering someone care at home, when the home environment is not safe, that's clearly not a sensible strategy. And finally, patient preference. And we must keep patient preference and desires at the heart of what we do. But interestingly, locally at least, we found that people who declined virtual care historically, now they've been forced to try it through COVID, actually find it quite a convenient way of accessing their care. So it's definitely a change that's here to stay. But we must, of course, be mindful that needs change over time and ensuring our services are dynamic and adaptable as people's needs change is essential. Moving forwards, we've been granted a clean slate, as have all healthcare services and other industries, and collecting data, what worked and what didn't work. Routine monitoring, how much is actually necessary as opposed to being done out of habit. How can we efficiently get medication to people, be that delivery to home, to their communities, and giving longer rather than shorter prescriptions, but doing all of this while listening to our patients and what's important to them is crucial as we move out of the pandemic. What can we learn? This paper summarises some of the parallel learnings between harm reduction for HIV and sexually transmitted infections and COVID, and it's well worth a read. They draw some brilliant parallels between condom use and wearing a mask, the importance of access to rapid point of care testing, the fact that abstinence does not yield benefit in the long term, it's not a realistic strategy to pursue. If we had pre-exposure prophylaxis for COVID, that would be great, but we must ensure we overcome the barriers that we've seen with access to HIV PrEP, which mean those most at risk may find it hardest to access. If we do get more effective antivirals against SARS-CoV-2, ensuring they're utilised early and equitably. And finally, of course, vaccination. We don't have an HIV vaccine, but we do have vaccines against, for example, hepatitis B and human papillomavirus. But overcoming the barriers to ensure people who need them most get them will be crucial. I've certainly learned that good evidence in a global pandemic is more, not less important. And the problem is we saw quite sensationalist reporting of unsubstantiated findings. Now, you'll be familiar last year with the data from France about hydroxychloroquine, which led to rapid inclusion of hydroxychloroquine in international guidelines. But better designed studies showed hydroxychloroquine yields no benefit. If anything, it may cause some harm. We saw similar when sensationalist reporting of the potential harms of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers led many patients to stop those drugs when large well-designed cohorts subsequently showed a lower risk of mortality for people on those agents. And another important lesson is an old lesson. Whether we're looking at people with HIV or at risk of worse HIV outcomes, people at risk of poor COVID outcomes, people at risk of any poor health outcomes. It's, of course, those underlying social determinants of health, housing, occupation, poverty, structural racism, and the fact that our ability to address these as healthcare providers will always be limited if we don't have coordinated, unified, structural, political and legislative change. The weathering hypothesis and the idea that chronic stress due to disparity in opportunities Due to race may explain racial disparities in health. The importance of occupation, this very recent data from the UK showing that healthcare workers and other key workers have a higher risk of severe COVID and that non-white essential workers are particularly impacted and adjusting for these in analyses and fighting to overcome some of these disparities is hugely important for us all. I just want to finish back on vaccine. This is a map and the pale blue countries are European countries planning to vaccinate all children aged 12 or older routinely. And that's despite the fact that there's a very low risk of mortality amongst young people, less than two per million per year from COVID. Now let's look at Peru, one of the countries worst hit by mortality per capita. And the fact that in Peru, only 13% of the population have had at least one vaccine compared to 66% in the UK. If we look at the actual mortality rate in Peru as of the end of June, rather than less than two deaths per million per year, there were 30 deaths per million in just seven days. 
And this really highlights that we have failed to make sure COVID vaccine is accessible globally. And as Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said, to effectively combat COVID, we must ensure everyone has access to treatment and is not denied healthcare because they can't pay or because of stigma. And that's a message that will resonate with all of us working in HIV. And there are many examples of success where HIV has overcome these barriers. But considering that was said back in March 2020 and that previous slide showing just how far we've got to go in terms of equitable vaccine access means we still have some distance to travel. And I think until we have a universal programme for injection of common sense into everybody, we will still have some way to go. I'd like to finish by thanking my colleagues, particularly those listed here, but really to acknowledge all people affected by HIV, COVID and health injustice globally. Thank you very much for your kind attention.